Hello and welcome to the Hub on CTPN. I'm Ong Guan in Beijing. And our guest today is Chen Changpei, the world-renowned architect and also co-founder of Pei Architects in New York. Fair to say that what he and his family have achieved is nothing short of the miracle in the world of architecture. Chen Changpei, along with his father, the legendary architect Ian Pei, have delivered several iconic architectural wonders the world over, including the Louvre Pyramid in Paris, France, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and the Fragrant Hills Hotel in Beijing. After founding Pei Architects with his younger brother Li Changpei in 1992, Chen Changpei went on to lead the design of numerous landmarks, including the Bank of China headquarters, Suzhou Museum, the Chinese Embassy in the United States, the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, Qatar, and Nanjing Six Dynasties Museum. What is the secret formula of building good buildings not just across geographies, but across cultures and religions? How to combine the free-ranging mind of a creative artist with that of the rigor and discipline of a scientist? Here's my conversation with Mr. Pei. So Mr. Pei, or should I call you rather Master Pei? No, um, no, no. Welcome no. back to China after what, four year um, pause? What would you say about the importance of face-to-face -face meetings with your clients after a, a three year pause? I mean, th this is more than necessary, right? I think it's absolutely necessary to have face-to-face -face because this is a real communication. We have now had almost four years of doing what we call Zoom. It's not the same, particularly, I think, in China. Because in China, you have a meeting during the day, and then you have a meal in the, in the evening. And this is really, I think, a part of the Chinese culture, is to talk business, but also talk and have informal meetings so people can understand who you are and it improves also the communication from the business side. In a, a TED speech not so long ago, you said this, China has lifted the majority of its population from poverty to self-sufficiency, but at the same time, some of China's cultural identity has been lost. This is a sacrifice all societies face. How do you look at it now? Do you think things remain the same as it was when you made that speech, that remark, or you know, things have been slowly improving? I think 95% is still the same. There is a price that you have to pay for progress. And I think that um, you, know, uh, you know, the Japanese had the same problem. After the World War II, the Japanese, when they wanted to do their development, they started to copy the West because the West was the most advanced. So it's natural that China, in not just architecture, but the way they conduct business, everything, will try to follow what happens in the West. Um, but because of that, you lose a certain amount of the Chinese characteristic of everything, whether it's in architecture, business, uh, anything cultural, even if you take, for example, music. But in architecture, uh, the reason that I said that about China is because I think that uh, Chinese architecture should have more and more Chinese characteristics. You cannot build a skyscraper and make it look like traditional Chinese tall building. I mean, people have said, oh, you will just make it look like a pagoda. I don't think that's the answer. I believe that really architecture is the inside expressing itself on the outside. The way the building, his design emerges from thinking about how it's going to be used, which is from the inside. You also have all the site planning. So in that part, by the way, I think there's many, many, many ways to have Chinese expression in the site planning in the Chinese contemporary architecture. Talking about uh, your background, you studied physics at Harvard College. How does that scientific background and that scientific mind inspire your career as architect? Well, there are not very many architects who have studied physics or any science for that matter. But uh, I study physics uh, and mathematics. This has had a great uh, influence on my own thinking as an architect. Architecture actually is um, problem solving. And so is physics, so is mathematics. But there is, it's a, it's a different from engineering because engineering you're applying formulas to get an answer. But in science you are trying to come up with a new answer to an old problem. The rigor of the process of problem solving step by step by step, you have the question. And you start with things that you know, 
And from one thing you know, if you know that, then you know this, and then you know that, and then you know that. But you still haven't answered the question. That is when the creative part of science comes in. When you get to the end of the known knowledge, and at that point, you are then using your intuition to make a guess. I should go this way, this way, or that way. But the big advantage, I think, of scientific training is that if you guess over to go this way, and it doesn't lead you to your answer, you only have to go back to where you just jumped from, and then you can go this way. When you run an architectural office, you're giving directions to your team, you don't have to go all the way back to the beginning. And so that it means two things. Number one, you will find your solution more quickly, and therefore more economically. And how do you reconcile the artistic part of being an architect and the scientific part? Because you design architects across the regions from the Middle East to Asia to Latin America. They're very different cultures, different religions, very different people and history. You have to take their different backgrounds in mind and at the same time having this problem-solving scientific mind. And I, it sounds like it's really, really difficult. It's difficult and not difficult all at the same time. You know, when you have been trained, you go through the decision-making process and you just try to use your experience so that you know, when you make this intuition, you hope that it's the best. You know, speaking of the different cultures, I think that's quite important because it helps you to make your decisions. Uh, people, the most difficult project that you can possibly, for an architect, I think I can say, is that you have a client that says, do whatever you want. <laughs> The more constraint, and this is, I think, the same in, in science, the more constraints that you have, actually the easier it is to find a solution. Points, lines, angles, graphics, shapes, and sizes are integral to the beauty of mathematics. When geometry is applied to architecture, it ignites new ideas and innovations. Under light and shadow, the geometry of architecture becomes even more captivating. Pei's architecture showcases the inherent charm of geometry in design. The Louvre Museum, with its large glass and metal pyramid structure, has become a global landmark in Paris. Meanwhile, the Suzhou Museum in China's Jiangsu province has cleverly blended traditional Chinese and local Suzhou design with modern elements to create a building that beautifully represents the essence of the old city. The design is meticulously planned, with simple geometric shapes such as octagons, rhombuses, and triangles serving as building blocks for various parts of the museum. Similarly, the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, Qatar is influenced by traditional Islamic architecture and values, but the design is entirely contemporary, featuring intricate geometric patterns. I.M. Pei chose a standalone island site for the museum to avoid issues with encroaching buildings in the future. These buildings are each landmarks in their respective locations, yet they blend seamlessly into their surroundings despite differing cultural, religious, and social backgrounds. People, many of your fans and followers and admirers notice the geometry in your architecture. They say that, uh, look, the Pei architects often produced very extraordinary shapes and forms, for example, uh, prisms, uh, parallelograms, triangle, semicircle, and cone. Uh, what inspired you to do that? To me, uh, geometry is really at the base of all good architecture. I mean, not all architects will agree with me, but I find that um, when you have a rigorous geometrical organization, it doesn't mean that the building has to be exactly everything the same and so on. But when you have that, we have, for example, we start out and we try to establish what we call module, which is a dimension which will repeat throughout the project. Now when you do that, I find that, first of all, there's a certain, it makes the planning very easy when you have a module. You know, you, when we design the building, uh, on the floor plan we have the paving pattern. If the paving pattern is following this module, it's very easy. But also, what about the lighting? And, so, and then you also have the module is going vertically. And so therefore, you have a certain amount of repetition. And 
with repetition uh, in architecture, you should have economy. So Mr. Pei, you mentioned your father, and you mentioned the fact that uh, the artwork should be an expression from the inside projecting to the outside. Is that the case with his masterpiece at the Louvre, where, you know, back in the day, 30, 40 years ago, only the French think they know Paris the best? Well, of course, you know, I um, was largely responsible to execute that project for him, so I know all the stories. Nobody has enough time to, to hear my stories. So that project uh, for him was really quite simple because the whole project had to be underground because of the old architecture surrounding. He said, you cannot touch it. But when you build underground, you have to bring in light. Without light, there's no architecture. So the pyramid, which he put in the courtyard, in fact, is just a skylight. So it, it was such a logical uh, way to bring light to the inside. That's when I say that the, the, the uh, expression of the architecture comes from the inside. It comes, in this case, from the need to bring in light to all the underground space. It was considered peculiar, but in a good way. It's extraordinary. I think that, um, you know, we spoke a lot about this. And he said, this skylight cannot be architecture. It can only be sculpture. So his, his thinking is that he's placing a piece of sculpture in the courtyard and not a piece of architecture. We have an architectural dilemma always, you say, how do you enter? How do you enter into a piece of sculpture? So that was, um, you know, these are the kind of intellectual questions that we always ask ourselves. But at the same time, the, the pyramid is only a skylight. Let's talk about some of your uh, architecture, the masterpieces, for example, the, the iconic uh, structure in the western part of Beijing, uh, the, the Xiangshan Hotel. Um, how did you come up with that idea? Just after China was beginning to open up again, um, people started to think, ah, we need to build hotels in China. China has hotels, but they are all, uh, they are not uh, international standard. So, and um, I don't know if you know this, but tourism is an enormous business. Uh, in fact, it's the number one business in France, of all things. So people were saying, if we can bring tourists to China, we can, we can make a lot of money, number one, but we can also improve the country. So it was, it was beneficial from the outside as well as from the inside. And so my father was, I think, the first a uh, foreign architect asked to design a hotel. And in fact, I remember very well at the time, they said, well, you can do 10 hotels, um, but to, to do a hotel in China. And for him, the challenge was not to design a hotel. The challenge was to design a hotel in China, which would be a way to show Chinese architects how to do modern architecture, but which had Chinese characteristics as well. Instead of, for example, just taking a Western hotel and trying to build it in China. And the reason that he selected the Fragrant Hill Park was because there was no other building there nearby. So he didn't have to worry about any of what we call the context of where it is, uh, and it could be just an isolated work of architecture that people could go to see. So you talk about Chinese characteristics, Mr. Pei. I'm wondering, uh, what do you think would be a good a prototype of an architecture that combines modern element with Chinese characteristics, now that you've visited all these Chinese cities throughout the decades? Chinese characteristics does not mean that you have to have uh, you know, Chinese roof or anything like that uh, to copy in a literal way. Because I think that when you're, you're trying to, to understand, um, what is the word, the, uh, the spirit of China in, as shown in its architecture. So uh, and that's why it's more, more complicated. What we did in Fragrant Hill is inspired by the architecture from central China which is where my father is from, from Suzhou. So it has you know, gray wall, white walls and gray t tiles, uh, 
Whereas at Beijing, you really don't have that so much. You have gray brick and so on. So it's not really a Beijing, but it does have Chinese spatial organization, uh, north-south uh, axis, uh, the use of light, courtyards, Chinese gardens, and so on. Uh, all of these things combined together. Uh, it's not a copy of anything, um, but uh, I think that most Chinese architects today will say that it is a building that can only be in China. Let's talk about another work of yours that is the East Gallery of the National Gallery uh, in Washington, D.C. I had the pleasure of visiting uh, upon my first few days there uh, as a D.C. correspondent when I was dispatched there to work. Um, it's one of the first substantive works that you've participated in, right? Does that represent your exploration of a, a democratic space and to design for the people? First of all, this is, is my father's design. I worked in his office. I was just a low architect, although I was given certain responsibility on the design. But I think that that building uh, represents something that my father always thought, which is that without light, there's no architecture. So what he wanted to do um, was to bring light in. And once again, you know, that project, uh, I, I didn't make this trip, but he went with the director of the museum and they went to all the museums of the world that the director thought were important to give inspiration. And one of the things that the director wanted to do at that time was to break down the scale. He thought that by visiting these big museums, even like the Louvre, uh, the British Museum, a Metropolitan Museum in New York, they're too big. And so he, wanted, he liked the idea of what he called the house museum. There are many museums in Europe, which is just somebody's house, maybe a rich man's house, and they collected art. But when you go into that museum, you understand how the art participated in the daily life of the person who lived there. So he wanted to have a museum that was a series of small museums. And so that is, when you look at the plan, you can see it's actually individual pieces of museums. And then, so then my father had the idea to have a big skylight to connect them all. We noticed that, and also you have been working astride cultures, obviously. The museum in Doha, Qatar, right. uh, is uh, much talked about and discussed by people in the Muslim world. Give us a sense of, you know, how did you design that piece of art? Well, once again, that's my father's building. So, but it was almost the perfect building for him to work on because, you know, in the Arab world, uh, the Arab mathematics is so strong. And um, so he did some research and he found a little, uh, uh, a little building in, in, uh, in Egypt, in fact, that inspired him to try to develop a kind of a perfect geometry which could only be in an Islamic country. I was really impressed, uh, Mr. Pei, when you said this, that your father considered a good building laid out uh, while appreciating the function of it. It ought to have always mirror the spirit of the nation and also the city, as well as the function as a vision for the future. Um, that sounds like a pretty difficult juggle. <laughs> well, you know, he, um, at the end of his career, most of his career was in the United States. But at the end of his career, everything was outside of the United States. It was in Japan, it was in Qatar, it was in France. He stopped doing work in the United States. Oh, why so? Because he was so interested in the other cultures. And it was his curiosity that made him go. That people would come to him, and if there was an American client, he probably would say, I don't want to go to Chicago. I've been to Chicago. But to say, would you like to go to Doha? Oh, I've never been there, you know. Or Japan, he had been to Japan, but he didn't know Japan. Uh, because when you go and work in another foreign country, you want to learn about that country, and you want what you learn to be expressed in your architectural design. And it should be something that comes from that country, not something which is, you know, taken from United States and just put it in another country. 
in a historic interview. Um, many consider that interview to be historic. Your father was interviewed by Diane Sawyer on 60 Minutes in 1987. That was nearly 40 years ago, and uh, he said this towards the end of the interview. He said, our society seems to be much more inclined to build something for a short term and tear them down. This disposable society of ours is not conducive to doing good architecture. This I'm unhappy about. Why is Paris so beautiful? Because the buildings were well built. They were built to last. Um, do you see the same problem now? This is absolutely still true today, but I, I'm hopeful because one of the uh, things that now, now finally architects are finally be taking into consideration is this issue that we call sustainability. Construction takes up a huge amount of the energy of a country, any place, to build. So if you build, you should build something that can serve its purpose for at least a reasonable amount of time in order to amortize the cost. Uh, the idea that you can build a building and just tear it down after five years because there's a better way to use that land, uh, that means that that's, a, I think that's, that's what he's talking about. That um, uh, when real estate values continue to go up so fast, all of a sudden the building that's there uh, is actually something that reduces the value. And, uh, and uh, so that means that you should build the building in the first place so it will be able to retain its value over time. But I lived in the United States, so did some of us here. Uh, we know that, that there's such a thing as racism, uh, be it latent or uh, explicit. Uh, how did you guys cope with that all through the decades? My father grew up in China, and he moved to, uh, to America in 1935 to go to do his college. So like a lot of Chinese students today, uh, in fact, uh, I think there's, at one point, there were almost 400,000 Chinese students in the United States. I'm talking about now. But in those days, there were not that many. So my father went in 1935. Uh, now, as, as far as um, racism and so on is concerned, this is a huge problem in the United States. He did do a project uh, in one of the, uh, the black communities in New York, in Brooklyn, called Bedford-Stuyvesant, because it was a project that Senator Bobby Kennedy wanted to do. So, uh, and that he wanted to show that you could do, with a small investment, you could actually make a big improvement in that poor community. The way to rise up is through education. You know, I mean, the Chinese have always had a huge value on education. And the big problem, I think, in the United States, or at least one of them, is that the uh, low-income people, especially the black people, don't have the same access to education as, uh, for example, white people. And then, Mr. Pei, how do you identify with your Chinese heritage, uh, with your you know, ethnic Chinese identity, and how do you think that has helped your later career? I can't avoid you know, the fact that I'm a Chinese American. I think that um, I like to contribute back to help Chinese Americans. And uh, so I, I participate in two uh, nonprofit organizations. One is called China Institute. The, the, the mesh mission of China Institute is to help Americans to know more about China. But it's a non-political organization, but we teach Chinese language, Chinese culture, we are going to launch a major initiative this year in Chinese culinary because everybody loves Chinese cooking. And then what would be your words to the aspiring young architects who look up to you, your family, uh, your masterpieces around the world, and who wants to be another you? You know, you have to love what you do. And I think if you love what you do, you find uh, good mentors. This You have to be... I always say you have to be optimistic, you have to be patient, and I think to a certain extent, if you're not um, you know, a, a regular American, you have to be, be a little bit aggressive as well. Mm -hmm. Finally, back to my home country, China. Um, what would be your advice to the city planners and the real estate developers when it comes to uh, you know, planning and designing buildings? Because we've heard so much about um, the Chinese buildings, some complaints as well. They say that uh, many cities look the same. This airport looks like the other airport. Uh, they look unanimous. 
uh, what would be your advice to the designers of China? To me, the problem in China is that everything is too big. So I think that uh, if the breaking down the scale will be better, you know, in, in Beijing, roads have, you know, six lanes on one way, six lanes on the other way. I mean, that's huge. And so uh, that means that this part will never communicate with that part. And uh, so even if you, if, you, if you live or you work there, and you, want it, you, you will not go to the restaurant that's over there, you see. So, uh, and I think that um, uh, if the scale can be broken down, I, I think that would be one, one small uh, contribution uh, that I can suggest. And also uh, to the parents who want their kids to have the best education, uh, what would you say when it comes to reconciling or combining the, the rigorous discipline training of science and at the same time the free-ranging artistic mind of innovation and being creative? I think, as I, since I'm a product of the American education system, and I, can, and I don't really know exactly what happens in China or, by the way, in Europe, but because my wife is... French. So, um, but I do know that in China and in Europe, when you are in high school, you are already channeled into a different direction, science, literature, whatever. Which means that by the time you go to college, you, your direction has been established. Whereas in the United States, it is when you're in college that you look and look at the, all the options and you make your own decision. And I think myself, from my own experience, that that's better, to delay a little bit this, the choice of which direction you're going to go. Because I don't think that when you're 14 years old that you really know uh, uh, what you're going to be good at. And by the way, just as an example, uh, you know, I studied physics and mathematics in college, but I, even at that time, then I, then I went into architecture. It's a little bit related, but it's not exactly the same. Mr. Pei, thank you so much for your time. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your trip in China. Thank you so much. Come back again, please. <laughs> okay. We learned a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it. That will do it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. I'm Ong Guan in Beijing. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you again soon.